So we have uh, on our staff one of the preeminent young artists, uh, HBO deaf poet veterans. Uh, his song right now, Bay Area Slang, is blowing up in the Bay Area. Uh, so can everyone, can everyone give it up? You all like that. <laughs> you can all give it up for uh, Rafael Casal.
The, the Haven Center has decided at the beginning of all of our lecture series, not just those devoted specifically to hip hop and related matters, but to all of our lecture series, we will begin with a poem and spoken word performance of this sort. I'm beginning to rethink it because it makes, the, it makes a very hard act to follow for our <laughs> distinguished speakers. Um, we are having some very distinguished philosophers coming who will be giving abstract and analytically clear and systematic talks on various matters, following an emotionally driven and powerful commentary on the human condition such as we have just heard. It will at least be uh, an interesting juxtaposition. It, however, does reflect why the Haven Center is so deeply connected to this new initiative on campus. Uh, it's hard enough in the modern university to think through ways of increasing dialogue between the social sciences and the humanities, but this is an even bolder effort to integrate social sciences, the humanities, and the arts, and to see these not as separable domains of human inquiry and endeavor, but to see how the dialogue and interaction between them can reinforce the best parts of each and transform them through the dialogue. Uh, the Haven Center is a site on campus that's committed to social justice and to thinking through theoretical and empirical and political questions around social justice, but we have not until recently seen the importance of connecting that to the arts as well as the social sciences and the humanities. And I'm hoping that our involvement with the soon-to-be hip-hop studies program and the mass hiring of new faculty in this area, which will follow the initiatives that we are helping to uh, form, that this will also be a way of strengthening our involvement in this. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our two speakers tonight. Jeff Chang has written extensively on culture, politics, the arts, and music. He is the, a 2008 USA Ford Fellow in Literature and a winner of the 2008 North Star News Prize. His first book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, garnered many honors including the American Book Award and the Asian American Literary Award. He was a founding editor of Color Lines Magazine and a senior editor-director at the Russell Simmons 360hiphop.com. He has written for the San Francisco Chronicle, Vibe, The Nation, and Mother Jones, among others. In 1993, he co-founded and ran the influential hip-hop indie label Soul Sides, now Quantum Projects, helping launch the careers of DJ Shadow, Black Alicious, Lyrics Born, and Latif the Truth Speaker. He has helped produce over a dozen records, including The Godfathers of Gangster Rap, the Watts Prophets. And after being politicized by the anti-apartheid and anti-racist movements at the University of California, Berkeley, Jeff worked as a community labor and student organizer and as a lobbyist for the students of the California State University System. He was an organizer of the inaugural National Hip Hop Political Convention and has served as a board member for several organizations working for change through youth and community organizing, media justice, culture, the arts, and hip-hop activism. Mark Anthony Neal is professor of black popular culture in the Department of African and African American Studies at Duke University. He is engaged in interdisciplinary scholarly work in the fields of African American cultural and gender studies that draws upon modes of inquiry informed by the fields of literary theory, urban sociology, social history, most postmodern philosophy, queer theory, and most notably, popular culture. His broad project is to interrogate popular culture, music, television, film, and literature produced within the context of Afro-diasporic expressive cultures. Neil is the author of four books, What the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Black Public Culture, 1998, Soul Babies, Black Popular Culture and the Post-Soul Aesthetic, 2002, Songs in the Keys of Black Life, A Rhythm and Blues Nation, 2003, and New Black Man, Rethinking Black Masculinity, 2005. Neil is also the co-editor with Murray Foreman of That's the Joint, the Hip Hop Studies Reader, which he is currently revising. A frequent commentator for National Public Radio's News and Notes with Farai Chidea, Neil also contributes to several online media outlets, including NewsOne.com, including NewsOne.com. <clears throat> Neil's blog, A Critical Noir, appears at Vibe magazine. Uh, just one note, after the 
lecture when we are having discussion. There are two microphones um, at the midway point uh, where Patrick is filming, and anyone who wishes to ask a question should line up by those microphones. And now I give you Jeff Chang and Mark Anthony Neal. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Is the microphone working? Yes. Okay, first off, my man. <laughs> See, I got a six-year-old daughter who asks too many questions and don't like following the script. So we've heard these conversations before, right? And, and just trying to encourage a young person to think beyond the world that folks want to impose on them is really a radical concept, right? So to hear you, you know, just break that down in a way that we can all appreciate, I think just gets the evening started in a great way. It's my privilege to be here this evening, back to Madison. Um, it's about my third trip here. The first time was when uh, the late and legendary Nellie McKay gave an incredible conference on the 100-year anniversary of the Souls of Black Folks. Privilege to come back about a year and a half ago for line breaks. And it's always a privilege <laughs> to do anything with Jeff Chang. Um, so we're going to talk each for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to you. My job is to do some, in some sort of way, in 20 minutes, give you a brief history of hip hop studies. Now, when I was a high school teacher in the Bronx, born and raised in the place we affectionately call Boogie Down, um, and I was teaching high school in Walton High School in the Bronx. And for me, trying, the, the beauty of it was I had this opportunity to bring hip hop into the classroom. There was no hip hop studies at the time. If I wanted articles for them to read, I had to make copies of articles by Joan Morgan and Greg Tate and Nelson George as they appeared in the Village Voice, which for all intents and purposes in 1989 was a journal of black popular culture. Um, and literally, there's no internet, there's no Google. I can't pull up hip hop lyrics on a Google search and then print them out. So I'm sitting there with cassettes and CDs and records and transcribing lyrics to songs, right? Trying to be able to bring some of this experience and bring a critical experience to my students in the classroom. One of the things I learned very early, and I only taught high school English once, <laughs> one year, <laughs> before I went off to grad school, what was always fascinating to me were the kids who normally would be walking the halls, but would always stop and stare into my classroom, right? As if the reason why they were walking the halls is because there wasn't anything going on in the classroom that interests them. So I would always open my doors and say, why well, stand outside? Why don't you come inside and be a part of the conversation? So at least at that time, you know, when I went back to school, thinking about just becoming a high school English teacher, right? That, that was just my plan. I get a little master's degree. Right? I get a little 12, maybe 10 or 12,000 more dollars in my check from the New York City Board of Education, and that would be my career. I got into graduate school, right? and it just happened to be this moment in time when all this stuff was taking place right? in terms of blackness and popular culture in the academy. We had what has been termed this generation of black public intellectuals. This is the moment that Cornel West is publishing Race Matters. This is the moment that Mike Eric Dyson is publishing Reflecting Black. Bell Hooks is publishing her books like Yearning and Black Looks. And suddenly, something amazing at least occurred to me that I had never thought about before, is that I could actually go to grad school and instead have to worry about learning the literature of the 19th century that didn't have any relevance to me in 1993, I could actually study black popular culture and black music, and guess what? Hip hop. And of course, I was immediately given some tools that none of us had expected. Right. At the time, when you went into the library and looked for studies in black popular culture, the one book that would come up over and over again was David Toop's book. Right. David Toop, who was this British journalist who was just fascinated with the sound of hip hop and tried to give it a narrative. Right. The book was called Rap Attack. The year was 1984. At the time that he published this book, no one would ever be expecting that we would be gathered the way that we are tonight talking about hiring faculty at a Big Ten school to teach hip-hop studies. David Toop couldn't have even fathomed that 
Even the people who read the book and reviewed the book couldn't even have fathomed the idea that we could be having this conversation. Now, of course, David Toop writes this book in a particular historical moment, right, that's framed by all kinds of circumstances that becomes important to discussing why should there even be a hip-hop studies. I like to use hip-hop, when talking about hip-hop studies, the idea of the Big Bang Theory, right? Meteorite comes from outer space, lands, right, makes a great hole, right? Scholars ask questions, right? So what hip-hop studies is, is about asking the questions. And not just about the questions about the meteor, or the questions about the crater, but the ripples in the fissures that extend beyond the crater. So that when you talk about hip-hop studies, to think that we're only having a conversation about rappers and lyrics and breakdancing and the rest of the elements, to think that we're only talking about the criminalization of African-American males in this society, misses the point because the fissures and the ripples extend wide from the birth of this thing. So even when you talk about hip-hop in the context of David Toop's era, you can't talk about hip-hop without talking about Reaganomics. You can't talk about hip-hop without talking about black political engagement and the first presidential run of Reverend Jesse Jackson. If you're going to talk about the first presidential run of Jesse Jackson, you have to talk about the rise of prominence of Minister Louis Farrakhan within that same context. If we're talking about urban life in the 1980s, right, this is when Jeezy was a baby, right, before he could talk about contemporary crack rap, you have to talk about crack cocaine in these same urban cities. Right? If we're going to talk about what's happening in these early days of hip-hop, when David Toop is writing this book, you have to talk about what's happening in New York City. The murders of Michael Stewart, Eleanor Bumpers, Yousef Hawkins, that creates the rise of black political engagement in New York City with the election of David Dinkins as the first and only African-American mayor. You have to talk about the films of Spike Lee. Right? Himself energized by the political issues that are taking place in New York City around race. When you see Do the Right Thing celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, the first date for Michelle and Barack Obama, right? when you talk about do, do the Right Thing, you're talking about what does the city of Brooklyn, yeah, I know it's a borough, what does the city of Brooklyn look like in terms of imagining what a multicultural America was then and is now? When you talk about Spike Lee, you have to talk about novels like Trey Ellis's Platitudes and his essay, The New Black Aesthetic, in which he talked about a generation of black aestheticians, right, who were taking cues both from the black arts movement of the 1960s, but also me imagining their place in the world as middle class kids growing up in the enclaves of American suburbia, right, and still trying to manage to articulate what blackness is, right? In 2009, that's a Spike Lee film and play called Passing Strange, right? But Trey Ellis was tapping into this with groups like Living Color, and I'm not talking about the series, I'm talking about the band fronted by Vernon Reed, and groups like 24-7 Spies, as folks were beginning to articulate just how complicated blackness could be in the post-civil rights era. If you're going to talk about hip-hop in the 1980s when David Toop was writing this book, you're going to talk about the generation of black and Latino and Asian and white thinkers who are being incubated on American campuses, right, in the 1980s. So I always use the example of, say, the University of Rochester, whose undergraduates in the late 1980s included Tabidi Lewis, who's a professor at the University of Washington, Bakari Kidwana, author of The Hip-Hop Generation, Tracy Sharpley Whiting, who is chair of the Black Studies Department at Vanderbilt, all right, and of course just authored the great hip-hop book Pimps Up, Holes Down, about hip-hop and gender. They're all undergraduate students at the University of Rochester at the same time in the late 1980s being impacted by hip-hop. But I could be talking about Howard University, where at any given time you have noted anthropologist John Jackson, historian Jelani Cobb, who will be here later this semester. You got Diddy running around giving parties. <laughs> you got April Silver, right, publicist to all these folks in 2009. So what you have are a generation of black folks in particular being politicized on college campuses because they're all being brought together by hip hop. So we go a few years forward, all right, 
And suddenly folks are getting ideas about, you know, this thing is happening out there, and we realize that the academy is a site for cutting-edge imperialist opportunities, right? So what's happening in the street gets incorporated into the academy. Trisha Rose writes a dissertation, 1989, coming out of the American Studies Department at Brown University. Right? She does a postdoc two years at Princeton University, where she completes the book Black, Black Noise the first major publication that really spoke to the reality of what hip-hop is. I always tell the story, I have a good friend, Greg Dimitriotis, who is associate professor of education at the University of Buffalo. I was a PhD student, he was a master's student. We were both taking a class with the great ethnomusicologist Charlie Kyle. Right? This is April of 1994. Trisha Rose's book comes out that month. Greg and I accidentally meet each other at an independent bookstore in Buffalo, New York called Talking Leaves. Stood there and waited for the owners of Talking Leaves to crack open the box so that we could buy those two copies of Black Noise. <laughs> In my mind, that's when hip-hop studies started. But even the year before, Houston Baker noted, literary critic and literary scholar, poet of some note, right, publishes a very small book, very difficult to read, as is most of the cases of the books that are written by my friend and colleague, Houston Baker, right, rap in the academy, right, hip-hop and black studies, right, where he wrote about the significance of hip-hop. And the reason why this was so critically important, because this is a scholar who had been in the field for 20 years. He clearly felt that hip-hop was so important that he needed to give his voice to it. This is 1993. 1984, same year that Black Noise drops, Michael Eric Dyson drops his very first book, right, reflecting black on African-American cultural studies. And, of course, Professor Dyson has this very interesting kind of hip-hop-like style career, right? As he tells the story, right? He, of course, wrote Black Noise when he was still, he wrote Reflecting Black when he was still completing his dissertation at Princeton. He got hired at Brown University as an associate professor without tenure, without a PhD. He already had two books under his name at that point in time. He went to defend his dissertation at Princeton. He came out of the theology program, right, went to a meeting to defend his prospectus, right? They said, this is great. Go on and do a great dissertation. Professor Dyson, again, very hip-hop style, reaches into his bag, pulls out his dissertation, completes it, puts it on the table, and then goes on to a career of some significance, <laughs> right? That same period of time, we could talk about all the books that are coming through that are charting the territory. Todd Boyd, writing from USC, one of the youngest tenured professors, black professors, but tenured professors in general at the University of California, right? Publishes a book, Am I Black Enough For You? Right? In which he takes postmodern theory, infuses it through what could only be described as the discourse of shaft, <laughs> to create something that is rich and unique and original, right? We could talk at the same period of time in terms of pe folks who are doing work that matters. John Michael Spencer edits two volumes of a journal called Black Sacred Music, in which he writes about the relationship of hip-hop as a continuum of the blues and the spirituals. At the same period of time, we could talk about the work of Robin D.G. Kelly, right? And you almost can't talk about Robin D.G. Kelly and, and not talk about hip-hop. But of course, when you talk about Robin D.G. Kelly, most folks the last thing they're thinking about is hip-hop, right? For those who don't know who Professor Kelly is, right? First of all, this is a cat that got his PhD when he's 26 years old. <laughs> Let me just put that out there, right? He did his undergraduate work from Long Beach State, right? And not to be in any way derisive of the folks who come out of Long Beach State, right? We'd like to believe that most of the scholars who come through and come to places like Big Ten Research One Institution at the University of Wisconsin were all coming out of prep schools and some sort of melon program and coming out of the Ivy League. No, Robin Kelly flipped burgers at McDonald's working and went to Long Beach State, right? Went to UCLA, walked out with his PhD at the age of 26, right? His first book, Hammer and Hoe, was about how the Communist Party functioned in the deep American South in the 1920s and 1930s. His second book, Race Rebels, right, is a book about black working class cultural politics and resistance. The last chapter of that book is a chapter called Kickin' Reality, Kickin' Ballistics, Gangster Rap and Post-Industrial LA. He said he had taken that chapter and given it to an editor at one of my former presses, Routledge. 
and said, I want to make a book out of this. And the editors told him, what? Right? There's no book to be written from there. Right? You're moving too fast. Why don't you go on and move on to something else? Right? And even today, it is recognized as one of the most original critical takes on hip hop as it exists in, cr in, cross in, in post industrial Los Angeles. When we talk about this moment of hip hop studies, you talk about Russell Potter's spectacular vernaculars. Russell Potter, who basically is a postmodern theorist, that realized there was something very interesting taking place in hip hop. Now, of course, you don't read Russell Potter because it's interesting to find out what was happening in the South Bronx in 1973 when Carl Cool Herc gave his first party. Right? That's not what you're interested in, right? You're interested in how someone can take hip hop ly lyrics and imagine a world that we didn't think existed before in the context of postmodern theory and push people's brains someplace else. Because ultimately, if we want to argue about why hip hop studies is important, it is its capacity to take us someplace else. When we talk about some of the other important books from that era, Drop in Science, which becomes one of the first important collections of essays. William Perkins coming out of Pennsylvania, right? Temple University Press. S. Craig Watkins, who will be here next week, who writes his first book representing about the relationship between hip hop and cinema. And then, of course, we got these folks who don't got little credentials at the end of their names, but whose research and scholarship was critically important to the field of hip hop studies. So we talk about Jane, so we talk about Joan Morgan, right? When chicken heads come home to roost, my life as a hip hop feminist, right? And she talks about, and, and I love this line, right? Because she was like, you know, here, I had come up coming out of Jamaica and a Jamaican father and what that meant in terms of gender and patriarchy. As an undergraduate going to Wesleyan, I had been exposed to mainstream feminist movement, but yet I found myself still loving hip hop, right? And as she puts it so concretely in the book, she was looking for a feminism that fucked with the grays, right? Something that made our engagement with feminism complicated, right? This is 1999. I've known Joan Morgan since she was about this high, because I was that high with her. <laughs> we got raised in a tenement building in the Bronx, 1231 Fulton Avenue. I first met her in 1968. She was my very first friend, right? Distant for 20 years, and we get back 15 years later, and guess what? We both got a bunch of books that we sell and walking around talking about hip hop studies. <laughs> All right. Same period of time, we get Jeff Chang. Don't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. All right. Offering a corrective to the history that existed on the ground that took into account that he needed to talk to the pioneers, right? But just because he needed to talk to the pioneers didn't mean the pioneers knew who Robert Moses was. Right? Just because the pioneers were there and had important stories to tell didn't mean that the pioneers could explain the significance of the Cross Bronx Expressway connecting the George Washington Bridge in northern New Jersey to eastern Long Island and how the Cross Bronx Expressway connects the George Washington Bridge to the Throgs Neck and Whitestone Bridges going across the East River to allow people to go out to pursue leisure at Jones Beach and other places in eastern Long Island. Right? And how Robert Moses, as a person who conceives of this, had no problem destroying black and brown and poor white communities in the Bronx just so folks could get through through the borough of the Bronx from New Jersey to Eastern Long Island in 15 minutes. All right. Without traffic. <laughs> Usually not 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday if you've ever been on the Cross Bronx Expressway. <laughs> and how when we talk about bombing in terms of graffiti, very often was folks on the ground that this was this response to these contraptions that had now destroyed their communities, right? So they bombed those contraptions, right? To make sure those contraptions and the folks who traveled on them knew that they existed. When we talk about folks who didn't have the credentials we thought that they should be looking for, we talk about Bakari Kitwan and the hip hop generation, right? Talking about hip hop is not just a music and a culture, but a movement, a generationally specific movement that engage in pol politics and culture and music and history and a range of things, right? So there's so much so that when you talk about Barack Obama in 2008, you can't talk about Barack Obama without talking about hip hop studies. And no, I'm not talking about little gestures like that doing speeches. And I'm not tell tell talking about him telling the school kids, yeah, you too can be like Lil Wayne. 
I'm talking about places like Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> right, where a bunch of grimy rappers had no problem making money from middle America, <laughs> going to places into the deep hinterlands of American life, away from the South Bronx and Compton and Houston in the Fifth Ward. They would come to places in middle America and perform. And guess what? Folks were like, this is interesting. This matters. Right? And of course, 15 years later, these are the folks not just working on Barack Obama's campaign. Right? These are the folks who are recognizing that Barack Obama needs to be connected to Facebook. Right? These are the folks publishing magazines like Fast Money talking about Barack Obama as a brand. <laughs> right? And of course, that's how he wins the election, because we didn't vote for the man. We voted for the brand right, of Barack Obama. Right? None of this occurs without this notion of hip-hop studies. But of course, in 2009, if we're going to be honest about what hip-hop studies is, hip-hop studies, of course, is a cottage industry. Right? I'd like to not describe myself as a hip-hop scholar. Right? I'd like to think that I'm much more complicated than that. Right? That I have a range of interests that go beyond my man crush on Jay-Z. Right? <laughs> For real. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, I know that, you know, when I need, get, when I need to pay some bills, <laughs> when I need to go out in the lecture circuit, ain't nobody paying me no money to talk about my love of Marvin Gaye and Bobby Womack. <laughs> All right? Ain't nobody paying me no money to talk about the history of Stax Records. All right? Ain't nobody paying me to talk about why Aretha Franklin is the greatest voice in the American 20th century. All right? But if I want to talk about hip hop, right, <laughs> that's when I get paid. <laughs> For real. <laughs> so let's talk about hip hop as a cottage industry, right? In terms of the number of books that Jeff and I, on any given year, publishers write us and ask us, can you blurb this book? Because that's Jeff Chang, American Book Award winner, <laughs> right? And if somebody else wants to eat off of hip hop, it'd be great to have that blurb on their book. Talk about folks going to graduate school and what is the great moment of the academy and suddenly, guess what? You can write dissertations on hip hop. I read about 15 of them a year. Most of them not at my institution. All right. Folks who are going up for tenure cases and promotion cases in the academy and their departments are looking at the work and going, we don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> All right. I wrote 15 tenure letters in the spring to put that in some sort of context. Right? Because what we have is a disconnect between what's being produced in the academy and the people who are actually there to be able to shepherd it through the academy. So when these departments get dissertations that need outside readers, when we get publications that need to be published by university presses and other places, they need folks who can be critical witnesses to why this work is good. Guess what? There are about six of us, <laughs> with tenure at least. Bunch of other folks in the pipeline, right? So what we have is this almost critical disconnect at this kind of moment. At the same time, we go to these conferences as academics and journalists, and inevitably we get paired up with a pioneer or some underground artist, right, who really got some beef with us. <laughs> Constant conversation, right, with, with, with you know, Bakari Kidwana sometimes calls the hip-hop smarty pants. Right, right. If I have to go to another conference, right, academic conferences, right, folks roll up on me, yo man, what you know about this? Right. I'm from ba 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 ba, right, we in East Lansing, Michigan, by the way. <laughs> right. What you know about that? I'm ba 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 ba. It's like, okay. And of course, you know, I'd like to think that whenever I have these discussions, I don't really need to be caught pulling out my ghetto pass all the time. Right. I don't need to be walking out on stage going, guess what, I'm from the South Bronx, I was there. <laughs> right? it, it seems to me that we should be <laughs> you know, respectful of each other to have opinions without necessarily having to show that somehow we were there as if being there actually matters. Right? Given my earlier conversation about the ripples and the fissures that extend beyond the meteorite. But yet we always have these discussions, right? And, and, and if Jeff wants to be honest, right? What does it mean to be Jeff Chang or an Oliver Wang 
or Joe Sloss, right, and do this kind of work. And folks rolling up here is like, whoa, 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 what's up with this? <laughs> All right. Same time, I'm reading dissertations from people writing in Yugoslavia, <laughs> West Germany, <laughs> right, Arab nations about how hip hop matters. And what we realize that hip hop, you know, whenever it travels beyond this little space in the Bronx where it was born, right, it opens up the imaginations of everybody who comes in contact with that. Right? And while there is an original tale, largely mythology, about where hip hop comes from in the Bronx, every place where hip hop landed, there is an original tale that matters, that needs to be told, that we need to bring intellectual and scholarly scrutiny upon. But at the same time, even as these pioneers get defensive, knowing that, you know, well, you couldn't possibly have been there. Right? Great example, right? There's a wonderful book on hip hop and 5% nation. Um, and I cannot think of her name, but she's a white woman who wrote the book, right? Felicia. And Felicia, right. And it's like, you go to conferences, it's like, oh, you know, presentation on the 5% nation. It's like, excuse me? Right? But of course, the bottom line is that she got access, right? She talked to the cats who knew the stories and wrote the books, right? Of course, what department is going to look at her tenure file and actually know what to do with this is another question. Right. But at the same time that we talk about these hip hop pioneers, right, let's have a conversation about intellectual property. Right. What do you do with people who have a legitimate case that we started this thing? Right. But we've never been able to live off of this to the extent that tenure professors do, that book award winning journalists do, that publicists and record labels, you know, y'all been following the whole Roxanne Shante story? Right. Does she have a PhD? Does she not have a PhD? Did her record company not promise or did promise to pay for her graduate education? Right. You know, when you're a retired rapper, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and let's be real about that, right? Let, let's be real about, you know, Mr. Drayton. <laughs> Mr. Drayton was living in an apartment where his 13, he didn't have the 13 kids with him, all right, because he owed child support on about 12 of them, all right, scalping New York Yankee tickets, all right, because he lived up the block on the Grand Concourse. He would come down, scalp Yankee tickets for $250. That was how he was making his living. MTV, Viacom comes calling, why don't you be on a reality show? You want me to dance? You want me to shuck? You want me to jive? All right, am I going to get paid? All right, he got his own reality show out of that. All right, and, and, and that's just in terms of money, right? What kind of health care do you think rappers get? All right, because this is the thing about hip hop studies, right? Let's talk about hip hop as a business model. Let's bring the business school into that conversation. Let's bring the law school into that conversation to talk about intellectual property. Let's bring healthcare disparity into that conversation, not just in terms of race and ethnicity, right? But what kind of health insurance does a rapper have? All right. How many rappers died of heart attacks and cancer and a range of other things in their mid 30s, largely because they didn't have health insurance? Because as rappers working for a record label, they weren't employees, they weren't even wage laborers. They were contract workers. All right. We're going to pay you to go do this and we have no other responsibilities for you. All right. What about the pension plan they got? All right. What's the average percentage that a recording artist gets for a recording? Anybody want to guess? Seven percent, seven cents on a dollar. And that's from the profits and not including things like production cost. And God forbid you in a group with five other cats and only four and you were the only one that got any talent. <laughs> All right. It's like Cisco, right? You walking around, you Cisco, <laughs> Drew Hill, doing your little thing. It's like, <laughs> jazz, damn, you ain't got no talent. Okay, right? <laughs> Let me sing dong, 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 dong. <laughs> All right. Make my little money, right? I'm still only getting 10% of what I'm getting, right? But Lita ain't got to share it with these stiffs over here who ain't got no skills and no talents. 
All right. Let's talk about class in hip hop. All right. We could just talk about it in terms of rosters, right? Why are Jay Z, Jay Z, Sean Combs, Sean Combs, or Russell Simmons, Russell Simmons, right? Because even as they understood how the game was set up to exploit them, they set up systems that simply exploit other folks. All right. What's the great story about Jay Z? And again, I love Jay Z, right? But ask Emil how much money she made being on Rockefeller. I think the story is that she got paid for some clothes. <laughs> Signed a contract for some clothes. All right. She gained 20 pounds. She couldn't even wear the clothes anymore. And of course, they didn't want her anymore because she gained 20 pounds. All right. So put hip hop even in that kind of conversation, right? And of course, to talk about hip hop in the context of politics in 2009, right? And it's not just about Barack Obama, and this is Jeff's thing, it's about Van Jones, All right? Let's talk about grassroots political activity. Let's talk about folks who got learned their skills on street teams 10 years ago and just applied those skills to campaigning for the candidate that they believed in a decade later. But I'm gonna stop there.